You may have just heard me say that we are moving to Smart Park next week, so we're looking forward to that. Right now, we are in downtown Winnipeg. But either way, we are in traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene. It's territory one, um, or sorry, treaty one territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We do respect the treaties and appreciate the use of the land. So before we start in with our two speakers here, I want to tell you a little bit about SeekNet and hopefully I'll share my screen correctly. Okay, and I think you're not seeing it properly. Okay. Now, are you guys actually seeing that in, in video mode? Okay, I'm gonna assume you are. Okay. Uh, okay. So the goals of, of the SeekNet project are to increase the adoptions of genomic, adoption of genomic technologies in the agricultural sector here in Manitoba. And we want to reduce Manitobans' current reliance on out-of-province sequencing services. And how we've done that is we've placed some sequencing uh, machines around the city. And we are hoping that people will make use of those either through collaboration or future service opportunities. Ivan is one of the, the people that does have one of the iSeqs. So if you're working in agriculture and you're currently sending samples outside the province for sequencing, or you have a project that you think could benefit from genomic analysis, you want to change a method to use genomic analysis to, to answer your questions better, or you just want to learn more about the project or think that you have some possible opportunities that could benefit agriculture that involve genomics, then I'd love to hear from you. There's, I think, lots of opportunities to collaborate. And um, it is uh, a project funded by the Canadian Agricultural Partnership and the province of Manitoba Agriculture and uh, Genome Prairie. So I think you guys all have my contact information, but there it is. And I can send it to you again, if you're interested. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And hopefully that worked. Okay, so let's get into our talks. The first speaker we have is Dr. Ivan Resnick. He did his master's at McMaster University in the area of rhizobium genetics. He received his PhD from Queen's University in the field of plant physiology and biochemistry in 1995. He did two postdocs at the University of Calgary, one in rhizobium genetics, followed by another in protein targeting and translocation in E. coli. Ivan has been a professor at the University of Manitoba since 2000, and he'll be speaking to us on using genomic approaches to improve rhizobial inoculants. So Ivan, I will give you the floor. And you got, are you seeing the title slide? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to, to speak today. And I've got about 20 slides, and I was told I'm going to take about 20 minutes. Um, I had the slides ready last night. I think this should go fairly smoothly, but I haven't done the timing. So if my timing's off one way or the other, I'll either give you more time in your day or less time. So the title is Using Adaptive Evolution to Isolate Nitrogen Fixing Strains of Resilient for Dry Beans. And I think one of the parts that I want to go through is the, the genesis of this project. So this project really goes back uh, a colleague of mine at University of Regina, uh, Dr. Chris Yost and I uh, hosted or organized a workshop for microbiomes and, and, and uh, crops in Canada. And as part of that, uh, Dennis Lang, who's with Manitoba Agriculture, as well as has an association with uh, the uh, pulse growers, was basically in my room and we're having a beer and he, he was going on. And that was all well and good, but if only we could do something for dry beans. 
And being mostly an academic, it was across that beer, I suddenly realized that dry beans were the same thing as physiolus vulgaris or just normal beans. And I basically said, I think I can help. Well, as it turned out, it's worked out okay, but it's also went through a few panic attacks where I thought maybe I had put up my hand too quickly. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the project. Okay, so if we go on and go to the next slide, just some of the statistics when we're looking at dry bean. It is, dry, dry bean is sometimes also called edible bean. Uh, most of it goes to human consumption. Within Canada, uh, we produce 490,000 tons. And the parts to go down is Manitoba is a major producer for dry beans within Canada. The other part that is a place where they do in, uh, some of the dry beans would be in Southwestern Ontario. Um, it is a cash crop. And the parts at the bottom is where this project really starts. There was no reliable nitrogen fixing symbiont available in Canada and the Northern US. And being a microbiologist who's worked all of his life in rhizobium, I said, that should be very fixable. And the other part to, to, to take home from this slide is that currently what's suggested is that if, when you're growing dry beans, the rate of fertilization should be 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, so why is that a problem? Well, <clears throat> beans or dry, dry beans are, are, a, are a legume. And as a legume, it has the ability to enter into a symbiotic nitrogen fixing association with rhizobium. So the way that this happens within the soil, the plants as, as they're starting to grow will, I, will uh, end up secreting plant factors, flavonoids, isoflavones, which are very specific to usually interacting, uh, signaling um, ry different rhizobia species. Generally speaking, the rhizobia species uh, when they get this signal, they start building something called a nod factor, which is something like a plant hormone, which allows it to interact with the plant. And it basically is a message saying, build me a house, I'm coming and I'm going to fix nitrogen. The way that it interacts is it usually goes through, uh, often, not always, uh, through a root hair. The earliest sign that you have an interaction is root hair curling. The bacteria then go through what is called an infection thread and are eventually released in the cytoplasm of a plant cell that had, has started to divide in response to the nod factor. Although it's in the cytoplasm, when it is released, it is within a plant membrane. So technically, although it's within a cell, it is technically outside of the cell. Where that goes is here, gives you sort of an overview. Um, the plant will take up carbon dioxide, uh, the products of photosynthesis, sucrose, are going to be translocated from the shoots to the roots. Within the roots, it's going to be given as energy to the plants that are within uh, the, the nodule structure. So on the left, we have, there's two different kinds of nodules that can be made. One is called determinate, they look round, which is what bean does. On the on the right, we have an indeterminate, which has a persistent apical meristem, just keeps growing outwards. And that is very common in things like uh, peas and alfalfa. The, the point being that when they're in this association, the plant provides glucose, which is carbon. The energy that went into making that is going to be released and going to be utilized by the bacteria to take atmospheric nitrogen, which makes up 80% of the atmosphere that we're breathing and is relatively inert and will reduce it to ammonia. The ammonia is going to be taken up either with, in the case of uh, uh, beans, they're going to be made, they're going to be in a purines. The purines are going to be given back to the plant. If you're looking and you're growing these legumes that are in an association with rhizobium that's effective and you're growing it under nitrogen free conditions, Basically, green means nitrogen. And if you don't, aren't, don't have the nitrogen, you're going to have something that's very chlorotic. Okay, so the point was, we thought we could fix an inoculum or make a better inoculum. And how were we going to do this? So 
Physiolus bulgaris and Rhizobium etli, the symbiont that interacts with it, are something that is studied academically. The, we thought we would first go about this as a point, uh, a proof of principle. So uh, uh, Rhizobium etli, strain CFN42, is originally isolated in Mexico. Its full genome was uh, sequenced relatively early on. It was published in 2006. And over here in this middle panel is what happened when we took our strain of CFN42 that was in my freezer and we put it onto beans that were provided to us by Manitoba Pulse. Here it's cultivar, cultivar Envoy. And it was just like I was told, they are completely ineffective. And here is what the result of it. You can see the leaves are chlorotic, not green at all. You do see some nodule structures. These would be the bumps in here. We'll get, get a more close up. And the question is why? The way that we were going to tackle this is we were going to use an adaptive evolutionary approach. So the adaptive evolutionary approach. So what we would do is if you follow the, the arrows on the other side, we would take CFN42 and we, uh, we inoculated uh, the, the bean plants. We would take what would look like one of the better nodules that, that would come up. We would crush it and then we would just basically let it sit overnight just to adapt as the bacteria were released. And then we would use it as an inoculum. And we kept doing this over and over again. When we first started, we thought we'd need to go out to about eight, uh, eight iterations. We really didn't know what we were doing. But, and we did this in triplicate. So each one of these lineages that you see is independent. So we're really quite surprised because the, the pictures are worth a thousand words. In this case, if you look at it, the plant on your right is the, uh, a bean plant that has been inoculated with CFN42 under nitrogen deficient conditions. On the left side, this one that looks really nice, green, leafy and healthy is what came out after about our third passage. So at each passage, we would take a strain basically and bookmark it. So we went through the entire lineages with the thought that what we're going to do is we could then sequence these strains and find out what kinds of mutations were there that were now allowing the bacteria to go on and become effective at nitrogen fix, uh, fixing nitrogen. So you can see that if we go on, um, it's, it's a busy table, but let's just pay attention to the last column. UIC over here is uninoculated. So if you look at a plant that looks sort of like this, we have about 260 milligrams of, of tissue dry weight. Tissue dry weight is being used as a proxy for, uh, as an integrative measure of all the nitrogen that has been fixed since as the nitrogen is being given back to the plant, it results in host. The strain that we started with uh, CFN42. It does have some nodules. Generally, we get a little bit better than the uninoculated, but it's in, within the same realm. And here is what, 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 we, what our first lineage was. And we focused on the first lineage, mostly because it tells the story a little bit easier, as well as we have a better handle. Uh, at what we found in other lineages is also corroborated here. Um, so you can see that as we go through the lineage, we end up with uh, RE104, which came out, out very quickly, uh, fixes nitrogen, and then it seems to level off. So it almost looks like there's two events that may be happening, or that's what we would have thought. But anyways, looking at the picture, you could see that the process appears to work. Now, the question with the proof process, would let's, there's some other things we've noticed. Going sort of from left to right, there's some changes that we could see as we're going, uh, as we we're taking pictures of what the roots look like. We would have started like this with CFN42, and then we sort of see a gradation. What, what I want you to see from here is they're going, the nodules are going from being scattered throughout the roots to becoming crown, nodule, crown nodulated. And they're becoming very effective, and you can see slight, a, a slight pink tinge. All of this is basically saying this looks like a very effective nodule. If we started to look to see how fast these, uh, they're interacting with the plants, we could see at the bottom graph, whereas in around six or seven days, um, we have about over 50% nodulation already, whereas the wild type, 
that we'd started with CFN42, we had hardly any nodules at all. So we had these, and now the question was, how do we end up analyzing them? Just as the pandemic started, we sent our first strains off and we got really terrible se uh, uh, sequencing. Uh, both at the same time, uh, Justin Hawkins, uh, postdoc in, in my lab, came back from a postdoc in Germany. And he was quite keen on saying we could do better. And we moved to the Oxford Nanopore uh, sequencing platform. So the basic workflow is we're going to have to extract the genomes. We make a library so it will be compatible with the Oxford Nanopore platform. It goes through a pore. Basically, what, what we're doing is it's going to uh, generate a difference in the in electrical charges. It goes through the membrane, which can then be converted to actual base calling. The data is there. You, get the, you have to clean up the data. We have to take all of the reads, make, uh, assemble them into larger contigs. We assemble the genome. We used basically two methods, either Minimap2 or Fly. Then we ended up doing the annotation using uh, Genius. Uh, which is a software which is very convenient for this. And then any mutations that we would have found, we would have to confirm using Sanger sequencing, which is just traditional, um, traditional sequencing, just to make sure that any of the single nucleotide polymorphisms, the SNPs, were uh, real as opposed to just a sequencing artifact from using the uh, Oxford Nanopore platform. So this basically is telling you that we learned how to sequence very well. Justin has gotten quite adept at it. And we went from the original grant where we had said we were going to sequence some of the strains to it suddenly becoming incredibly access uh, accessible to us. And we were able to sequence all of the strains, which gave us a better picture of knowing what kinds of mutations were actually there and if they were uh, found in stra strains further down the lineage, which helped the, uh, 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 the analysis. You can see that we ended up with uh, a very, very good coverage. We basically uh, had 100x coverage. We started with first with our wild type strain, then every strain in, in all of the three lineages. Again, I said, we're gonna focus on lineage one. And so when you get these uh, SNPs, you start looking and saying, what are they, where are they, and are they real? So we end up with, you can see the genome coverage we have. The two column, the three columns here tell you basically what types of mutations they are and what they might be affecting. Frequency is going to tell us how many times in the 100x coverage, how many times, what's the percentage that that was actually seen. So again, we had it uh, narrowed down, but once we went through the uh, sequencing, you could see that we had a few that were very, very uh, prominent. They would happen and then they would be fixed. So we could see that the first one we'd always see was this one in every single one, a GMD, and we confirmed it. And then we would also see then this other one coming up below that. Now, this is all well and good. So we're starting to have a handle of what the genetic changes might be that are allowing this to happen. So a a student in my lab, Adria, is now working with Justin and what they're doing is reconstructing these so that we can know for certain that what we are actually doing, uh, the changes we're seeing, that we can recreate them. So that's well and good. But going back to the point, CFN42 is uh, isolated in Mexico. Um, Rhizobium falls under the Fertilizer Act. We'll probably use it here, but it really isn't adapted to uh, a Canadian or winter or what you might see even in, in the Northern Plains in the States. So part of what we said was we, we thought we could find strains and that can, can, might be better suited to compete in, in our soils, and we might be able to use this adaptive approach to make them better. So the point was if we could if we can find something that makes a nodule, we now have sort of proof that maybe we could go on and, uh, and, and make it better. So that was where, where we went with the, the second part of the project. The pandemic didn't help us that much. So as we were going into the years where we said we were going to isolate the strains, we were pretty much sitting, having Zoom meetings and saying what we wished we could do. We had soils that were left 
um, from a, another project that I was involved in. It was a rotation study with uh, Dr. Yvonne Lawley in, in agriculture. And we had soil samples from Kelburn, Carmen, and Melita. And the idea was, we'll use these soils and basically say, can we trap any, any rhizobia that form nodules? So we did these nodule trapping experiments. So again, we take uh, the beans and we're growing them under nitrogen deficient conditions. But instead of using a, uh, a bacteria as, as the inoculant, we just used the soil as the inoculant. And if you look at these, you could see within the picture, Many of them are yellow chlorotic, not so good. Some of them are actually looking green. So the next part with that is what we would need to do is we would take the nodules and you can see here's a picture of one that we pulled up. We would isolate a nodule, surface sterilize it, basically crush it to release the bacteria. And then what we would end up doing is purifying it. This is very typical of what rhizobium looks like on, on a, a, on a on a complex medium, very gummy, very mucky, and we basically purified them. To do initial isolate, uh, uh, identification of it, we would just sequence the a part of the 16S region, the V3 or the V4 region. Basically, this is common in all bacteria. So by doing this and aligning it to a database, you can usually get an idea of what the species that might be, or at least at the phylum level. And we found three of them, the ones that are in bold, are very much typical of what you might expect for, for being uh, species that interact with beans. And to our surprise, we found a number of these that would, their closest match would have been Cyanorhizobium meloti, which is something that is usually associating with the, like plants with sweet clover and alfalfa. Very, very different. So the quick under the isolate, if it has a C in front of it, it came from Carmen, a K came from Kelberg, M came from Melita. So you can see that we were successful finding these in all the soils that we looked at. We had taken these and taken them to be, be sequenced. The long and the short on it, on the ones that are rhizobium and they very much look like the Etli. One of them was a rhizobium gallicum and two of them look like they are new species that we have, that we have found and that we have just currently submitted that for, for, for publication. The other part that we went into is like we would have also taken these and looked at them and said, can we start evolving them? So here we have a graph that was uh, done by a technician in my lab, Patricia, who we could see where the passages are on the bottom, which generation they're in, where they've started. The first bar here, NC, is the uh, uninoculated control. Then you see each of these strains. As we're taking them, through each passage, you can see that they are starting to gain the ability to be uh, much better at fixing nitrogen. And over here, the picture is always better than all sort of looking at the, at, the, at the bars. You can see that they are starting to look very good. These are still early on in these, but we are confident that this is working. Now, the other part of it, I'm just going to say a few words here with the cyanorhizobium strains. The cyanorhizobium strains are nothing like we have seen before, they're close as we did the phylogeny as well uh, based on 20 conserved genes as looking at the, the also the genomes and their annotations. And they are closely related to the Meloti, but they look very, very different. And we think that these particular strains, uh, because they, they grow a little bit faster, they have some greater tolerances might actually be a, a, a show the potential of being a novel type of a bean inoculum. So I'm going to leave you off with just a very few conclusions. We've successfully evolved a variant of our wild type CFN42, showing the proof of principle that this seems to be working. They have conserved uh, mutations that we have identified. And we are currently have uh, a number of isolates in our collection that can interact with beans and we have basically started evolving these with the hope that we will take these all off to the field shortly. So acknowledgements where, where it's due. Uh, Justin is the person who basically spearheaded all of the sequencing. Subjit uh, and Gangapreet were two uh, graduate students 
who were in, initially on the project and went through the orig original uh, uh, characterizations. Badria is currently a uh, graduate student who is working on showing that what we have found for mutations is actually uh, correct. And Patricia has also been involved with this and other uh, projects within the lab and the funders on the other side. So thank you very much for your time and thanks for the opportunity. So. Thanks, Ivan. Okay, how do I stop sharing? <laughs> uh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, next up we've got Matthew. Matthew uh, Bucker did his doctorate in plant, phys plant pathology at the University of Minnesota. He had postdoctoral training at Colorado State University, then worked as a staff scientist for the US Department of Agriculture. He joined the University of Manitoba in the summer of 2019, and he'll be speaking to us on profiling crop-associated microbiomes by amplicon sequencing. Okay, thanks, Raquel. So I, I took a bit of a guess about the audience and decided that I would kind of emphasize the, the technique or the approach rather than uh, going into a sort of a results heavy presentation. So I'm hoping by the end of this that you uh, will come away with a pretty good understanding of what is microbiome profiling and how is it implemented? And if you have been considering or are planning to do microbiome studies, I think uh, this will give you a good sense for what, what you would be getting into in that case. So what, what does the term microbiome mean? You know, if we look at any, really any uh, environment or sample on earth, like this little kernel of wheat that I've shown here, if you look you know, close enough, you'll see that really it's teeming with microbial life. And the, the term microbiome has been coined to catch the idea that, that there's this, this sort of full community of organisms living everywhere in and on our bodies, but also in plants and soils and, and everything. So I think the meaning of the, of the term has really been obscured by the way we pronounce it. And I, try, I tried for a little while to call it the microbiome rather than the microbiome, but uh, eventually kind of gave up and, and have gone with the standard pronunciation. But if we'd say microbiome, I think it would be more intuitive what we mean, that it's the full complement or the complete set of microorganisms in a given sample or environment in a way that is very consistent with these other terms that we are familiar with, genome, the full complement of genes, proteome, you know, the full set of proteins, so on. So the microbiome is, is a term that just reflects what is the full complement or the complete set of microorganisms that uh, inhabit a particular environment or sample. <clears throat> so, with that understanding, a microbiome study is basically asking who is there in terms of the microbes in a, in a given environment, which microbes are living in this place. And in other you know, aspects of science, people who study animals and plants have had a long history of being able to ask that question through more straightforward means. So a, a plant person can just go and you know, visually count the different kinds of plants that are present in a place or an animal researcher might you know, set up camera traps and be able to just visually see what are the animals that are here, as in these pictures from my father-in-law's cabin. So microbiologists, we can do something similar. We can you know, isolate individual strains of microbes in a way like Ivan just described, grow them up in pure culture on a rich medium and, and uh, do some amount of differentiating among them, like these two. Uh, different cultures that I've shown here. The real challenge though for microbiologists is just the, the small scale of these organisms or their tiny size. So if you look at the ruler on the left there, you know, between those millimeter tick marks, you could line up 100 bacterial cells end to end between the, you know, one millimeter and the next, or you might line up 10 fungal cells in that same space. Or if we you know, have as our frame of reference this, this spoonful of soil here, say that's about five centimeters across that little tiny soil sample. If we sort of extrapolated that to the human scale, you know, for a bacterium in that soil, it's roughly equivalent to 
what a human would experience as a 10 kilometer distance across that. So essentially, you know, the entire city of Brandon plus some more would be captured in that space at, at sort of the equivalent body size to extent. So now if we ask the question, you know, we pick up a little bit of soil and ask who, who is in here in terms of the microbiology. It's a bit like, you know, somebody in an airplane looking down at the city of Brandon and asking, oh, I wonder who lives there. Well, it's, there's thousands of, you know, inhabitants and so on. So that hopefully communicates something of the challenge that we have as microbiologists asking this fairly straightforward question of just what are the organisms that live in this place? <clears throat> okay, so the, the workflow for microbiome profiling is typically what I like to call amplicon sequencing. So that's what we're going to go through in a couple of uh, the following slides. The basic steps are, you know, I guess I should have had even before collect your sample, you need to maybe design an experiment. But you say we've got samples, we're going to turn those into DNA, we're going to turn DNA into amplicons, which we'll see what those are in a moment. We're going to sequence those amplicons and then we'll have to do some bioinformatics to interpret the result. So one of the beauties of this approach is that it's really, uh, really flexible. It can handle almost any kind of sample. You can take plant tissue, you can take soil, you could swab surfaces or swab, you know, bodies. You could filter water, take substrates like, you know, ground up grain. You could look inside the rumen of of our livestock animals, any of those kinds of samples and a and hundred others could be sort of inserted into the top of this workflow and then all the rest of it is going to be largely the same regardless of, of what the sample was at the beginning. So that's one of the strengths of the technique. Okay, <clears throat> so the first step is we need to convert our sample into DNA. DNA is what's going to contain the information that lets us ask, answer that question of who is here. We'll see the, we'll see the clues to that in their DNA. So there's lots of, lots of nuance to this that you have to you know, appreciate when you are working with actual samples, but for now we'll just say you know, there's, there are processes through which you can convert most any kind of sample into an extract of DNA. However, what you know, may not be immediately obvious is that that DNA will actually be a mixture of the DNA of many different organisms. So if you take a leaf, you know, of, of barley and extract DNA out of it, you're going to have a lot of barley DNA in there, in that extract, but you're also going to have DNA of the bacteria that were on and inside that barley, of the fungi that were on and inside that barley, and so on. So this DNA extract is going to be a, a complex uh, I call it a mixed bag, you know, the components of many different organisms. Indeed, ideally, all of the different organisms that were present in that starting sample. So I just made some of the cartoon DNA here, two different colors to indicate you know, there's, there's more than one organism uh, represented among this collection of DNA molecules. All right, so one, one approach to using DNA to ask you know, who's, who's present in this sample would be just to chop up the DNA and sequence as much of it as we can, and there would be, you know, volumes of information there. However, that uh, that approach is expensive, and we wouldn't be able to do very many samples. That would be what we call metagenomics, where we're looking at the full complement of all the genes across a community of organisms. For microbiome profiling, typically we are trying to simplify the DNA so that we sequence um, a smaller range of DNA but still answer our question who is there in a way that's cheaper, faster, lets us do that analysis on a larger number of samples. And so we have this step of converting the mixed extract of DNA into a pool of amplicons. So I've highlighted two little portions of those colored DNA molecules here to kind of get them, give the message like, okay, in the, in the organism whose DNA have colored blue, you know, there's some small stretch that would tell us the identity of that organism. 
in the organism whose DNA I've colored orange, there is similarly, you know, all we need really is to, is to get a sequence for this small piece of the genome. And we could tell you a fair bit about what the organism was uh, from which that DNA came. So <clears throat> the ideal target for producing these amplicons, uh, you know, would be a gene that is present in every organism and uh, could be amplified by PCR, but would still be variable among organisms so that we could use a variable sequence in that gene to infer the identity of the organism from which it came. Okay, so if we are only interested in those highlighted portions of all of the more complex DNA extract, we use PCR to make lots of copies of just that region. So this would be a cartoon illustration of, of what would happen to those two highlighted uh, genetic loci after just eight cycles of PCR. We have made many, many copies of those regions of the genome, and now they're in smaller pieces. And so amplicon sequencing, let's see, each of those pieces produced by PCR would be what we mean by the term in amplicon. So we could separate out those fragments based on their size and only sequence those. Now we're not sequencing, you know, a thousand different genes from the same organism. Instead, we're sequencing the same gene from as many different organisms as are present in the sample. <clears throat> All right, and then there are some very important, but a little bit technical tricks that we do to make this economical and efficient and so on. And the one I'm gonna talk about here is the fact that we create these molecules that are sort of a hybrid of biological and artificial sequence. So in the amplicon from the previous slide might be depicted as this green line. And we're going to do some steps in which we add totally artificial sequence onto that DNA molecule. Something that has no basis in the organism or in you know biology outside the lab. We're going to put extra DNA sequence on the ends that will tell us this amplicon came from a certain sample. And we need to do some additional artificial sequence to make this thing work with the uh, DNA sequencing instrument. So our final amplicons end up being these kind of hybrid things where we have some actual biological sequence information in the middle, and then we've added some artifactual sequence or some artificial sequence uh, on the ends. And what that allows us to do is to process many samples uh, together. So here I've got a 96 well plate. You can have 96 samples represented here. In each well of that plate is a collection of amplicons from a different sample. And every amplicon in, in a given well is going to have that same artificial sequence added onto it here. Uh, we call a barcode or an index sequence. So that in our final sequence data, one of the first things we'll be able to do is look for those artificial sequences and split the data into the sample of origin as a result. <clears throat> so in this, in this illustration, if we had 96 samples, each uniquely barcoded, we could combine those all into a single, we call it a library that would be sequenced and we'd generate millions of observations of the sequence of that particular gene that we targeted across all of our samples. So the output is, is this large number of sequences, and then it takes a fair bit of uh, computational bioinformatic work to kind of translate that into something that is intelligible. Ultimately, what we're looking for is, is basically this, to go from some observed sequence into information like what sample did this sequence originate from and what organism is it likely to represent. So we see that first observation after a bunch of computational work, we're gonna conclude, okay, this is an observation from plot one, and it looks like it indicates the presence of Fusarium, which is a, a genus of fungus in that sample. And similarly for every other sequence in the data set. And this will be millions to tens or hundreds of millions of observations. 
And I just want to, you know, be honest about the fact that there's going to be errors, mistakes, confusion, confusing things, and things that don't make sense in the data as well. So for some portion of our observations, we're going to have to say, you know, I, this, this looks like a mistake. It looks like an error. I'm going to discard it. Or we have to decide, um, you know, I don't know what kind of organism this came from or whatever. There's lots of sort of judgment calls that have to be made along the way. But once the data set has been fully processed, this is basically what we're driving towards with this method, which, which I call a taxon abundance table. Again, you know, the, the motivating question is sort of who is, who is here? Well, this is, this is our answer through the data. So we have, uh, you could lay out your table as you, as you would find intuitive, but here I've got samples as columns and taxa as rows. So uh, let's see. So here's a, a bacterial genus called Massilia. In this sample, I saw sequences that looked like they come from that organism 46 times. In the next sample, I saw sequences that looked like they come from that organism 358 times, and so on. And, and in a contemporary microbiome data set, you would have this information across hundreds of samples for thousands of microbial taxa. And that's really in the, still in somewhat of a raw form, that's the answer to the, the motivating question of you know, who, lives, who lives in this environment. Now it takes a fair bit of you know, statistical analysis and um, visualization and, and lots of kind of iterative uh, working with this data to draw conclusions and implications out of it. <clears throat> but one thing that um, is easy to forget, but, but you know, critical to remember, is that these numbers are not really densities. They're not uh, absolute abundances. Instead, they're what we call relative abundances, or what a statistician would say, this is compositional data. So we have to think of this, each, each observation is really like a random draw out of, a, out of this bag. So if this bag you know, represents my sample, I'm going to draw maybe 50,000 uh, amplicons out of that bag, identify who they belong to. But I have not profiled every uh, piece of DNA that was present in that sample. And all of my numbers here are only relative to the total number that was sampled. So 304 out of 50,000, not 304 you know, per gram of soil or whatever. So that's, that's really a key, a key uh, thing to keep in mind for microbiome data is the relative nature of it or the compositional nature of it. <clears throat> okay, I could you know, go on for a long time about, about some of the risks and hazards and, and dangers of this method. I'm just listing some of them here kind of for you for you to read on your own, uh, because that would be sort of a separate, a whole separate talk. But we do need to be upfront and aware of all the weaknesses so that we uh, draw the most well-supported and robust conclusions that we can out of the data. And just, I'll let you take a screenshot or something if you want to catch that list and, and read it in detail. So then I just want to, now illustrate very quickly four uh, different scenarios in which I've, I've found this approach to be useful for agricultural research. So how does microbiome profiling advance agricultural research? Here's one example, understanding cover crop impacts. So cover cropping is a practice that's um, promoted for conservation, soil and environmental quality kinds of reasons. You can see here, what it would look like in a, in a corn silage production system where uh, you can see the stubble of the corn crop that's been all harvested and removed for silage. Over here, this is sort of the default scenario of a lot of bare and exposed soil that's gonna be prone to degradation and erosion and, and a host of kind of bad things. As an alternative, we may plant a cover crop in there to try to protect and promote the quality of the soil and adjoining you know, water bodies and so on uh, by having the soil protected by this living cover. Or here we see a cover crop 
now as the as the residue. So there was a cover crop grown in this field in the fall, over winter, it grew again in the spring, and then it was actively killed with an herbicide, and corn was planted into that cover crop uh, residue. So <clears throat> this is a this is a desirable and a beneficial practice that we'd like more farmers to do. However, sometimes it's been observed that in this particular case, corn planted into winter rye cover crops uh, sometimes performs poorly. And so the research question here was sort of, you know, why is that so that we can improve our management and avoid that? So by profiling the microbiomes associated with those cover crops, including as they were dying, so the herbicide terminated, and they go through this you know, process of, of death and tracking what's happening to the microbiome of those plants through that process, we were able to identify specific disease risks for the corn that was planted subsequent. So we could see you know, particular taxa are increasing in abundance in the roots of these cover crops as they die. Those taxa are also able to cause disease on corn. So here's a, you know, a risk that might explain some of the uh, reduced performance of the corn following the cover crop. And then we can adjust our management of the corn crop to avoid or to minimize that risk. If we minimize that risk, you know, maybe, maybe we can uh, broaden and accelerate the adoption of cover crop. <clears throat> the second example is a, is a more contemporary project in my lab, which is to link microbiomes of soils into the assessment of soil health. So soil health is, a, is an attempt to sort of get a, a holistic understanding of what makes soils function well and resiliently for, for agriculture. And historically, much of the um, assessment and judging of soil health has been based on physical and chemical properties of those soils. But there's, I think, a, an increasingly uh, recognized need to also incorporate aspects of soil biology into measures of health. And so that's a that's a currently ongoing project. And for example, you know, some examples of how microbiome characterization may support an understanding of, of soil health and its change in response to management practice. That information about you know, what are the microbes who live here in these soils that can be used to ask questions like, well, how frequent are anaerobic microbes in this soil? And that might tell you, for instance, something about the past history of water logging in that soil. How, how frequent or you know, how many different kinds of plant pathogens are present in this soil? Well, that might tell you something about the likelihood of you know, soil-borne disease developing in a field. Or as, as society increasingly comes to ask agriculture to do functions in addition to food production, we can ask things like, well, how abundant in this soil are methanotrophs or you know, those bacteria that can consume methane out of the air? That's, that would be a desirable thing for agricultural soils to do more of, for example. So this project is a collaboration with some agriculture and agri-food Canada researchers, Steve Crittenden and Oscar Molina. I have student, I have a graduate student, my dad, and a co-op student, Heidi, working on this project with funding coming from the Manitoba Crop Alliance, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers, and uh, matching funds from the CAP program. <clears throat> All right, a third example here is um, that profiling microbiomes can help us predict disease risk for emerging crops. So there's, a, there's sort of a new kid on the block. Intermediate wheatgrass is a perennial grain. Um, so uh, unlike wheat and barley, which need to be planted every year and then you know, senesce prior to harvest, this plant would regrow across multiple growing seasons from the same roots and crown, and there would be uh, enormous environmental benefits associated with that ability, although it's, it's got a lot of development yet ahead of it before it's a competitive crop, it's an emerging uh, specialist crop right now. <clears throat> So if we ask, you know, well, which microbes live in association with this crop, which is not yet well understood or studied or widely grown, 
that might uh, help us anticipate what are some of the diseases that are going to likely uh, become problematic over time and so on. So just as a quick illustration, and this is a bit small, I guess, um, maybe you can make out there that Xanthomonas, which is a, a genus of bacteria, is very abundant in association with this crop. So most, you know, more than, more than half of the observations of bacterial genes that we make in a microbiome profile from intermediate wheatgrass, at least on the spike and the rachis, are from Xanthomonas. So Xanthomonas also causes bacterial leaf streak on wheat and barley. And so maybe as this crop expands, uh, bacterial leaf, leaf streak is, is kind of waiting to become a problem and, and should get some attention early on so that we can prevent it from becoming a, a costly problem. So that is also current uh, work that's going on in collaboration with Doug Catani from University of Manitoba Plant Science, who is breeding this crop, and also Catherine Turner from the Land Institute, which is uh, the organization that has really spearheaded the development of this crop. And I have a graduate student, Taryn, uh, working on this with funding from an internal program within the university. And finally, just one more quick example. <clears throat> that profiling microbiomes can help in identifying causes of quality defects. And this is really centered on malting barley, uh, the crop for which you know, quality attributes are, are just exceptionally important, more so than for almost any other, any other crop. You can't just grow you know, any barley and use it for malting. It has to meet these very exacting standards to be accepted for malting. But the malting, you know, process and environment itself is also the perfect environment for a lot of microbiology to go on. And so um, we're asking questions about how do the microbiomes of these, of barley and of barley in the malting environment, how does that impact quality traits of the malt? So things like mycotoxin contamination, but also the, um, the extent to which batches of malt tend to produce problems later when they're used in brewing, like gushing, like premature yeast flocculation. These are, these are quality related problems that have their root in microbiology that happens during barley growth in the field, barley storage, and particularly during the malting of barley. And that uh, ongoing work is, is collaborative with the Barley Breeding Program of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Brandon, James Tucker and Anna Badea in particular, and graduate student um, Anurata working on that. Current funding is from the uh, American Society of Brewing Chemists Research Council. So those are very, you know, very quick little connections between microbiomes and supporting agricultural productivity. But the, you know, the message in a nutshell is that these, these tools for profiling microbiomes by amplicon sequencing uh, have really opened our eyes in a much more comprehensive way than we ever were able to in the past to see the full diversity of microorganisms that are associated with these agricultural systems. And in time, that, that new insight is going to lead to improved management to support uh, and improve productivity. So that's my message. If you want to learn a bit more about my research, you can scan that code and it will take you to my lab website. And my email address is there as well, but uh, I'm also happy to take questions. Thanks, Matthew. I was actually wondering uh, how you do go about sharing your, your results with producers, if you're able um, to do that. Yeah, well, um, with the, so the cover crop work is really from my days with the US Department of Agriculture. And there we did um, a little bit more direct, you know, participation in field days and, and that kind of thing, having um, demonstrations with farmers would come and see these cover crops in real life. And we could talk about disease risk and its basis and its management and so on. Um, so the other examples are, are sort of projects that are still in the, uh, data generation phase and so they haven't had as much uh, extension or translation yet but but i'm hoping it will come yeah it's great if you can actually have an impact on on uh, farmers processes so we have 
We have some questions here that people have asked. Um, we have from Natasha Klaponsky. She has asked Dr. Resnick, what were some of the main sequence differences you saw in the brand new strains you isolated compared to S. melil All right, let's see if I can remember these. Justin is probably the person who knows th these better. Um, they, they, like, w when you start looking at the genomes uh, on a whole, there's, there's a number of different statistics that you would look at, one of being average nucleotide identity over a certain uh, period, as well as uh, digital DNA, DNA hybridization. And basically, th those are going to be tell you how close, if they are one species or if they're different species. Um, so we, we did do that. So there are a lot of differences, like, uh, for example, uh, Sinorhizobium maloti is very typically has uh, a chromosome of about three and a half megabases, and then it has two large replicons. One is a, a chromid, about 1.6 megabases, and uh, a large plasmid of 1.4 megabases. The first thing that, 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 that jumped out at me is the replicon structures are just completely different. We've done some uh, growth analysis using uh, uh, biolog type plates, 96 well formats, 96 different uh, uh, carbon sources. And you can see that there are clearly uh, differences within uh, their capability of using different carbon sources. So uh, specific, specific, it, it's not anything in specific, it's just general all, all the way across. Clearly there are some things that are you know, absolutely identical or very close to identical, but then there are also the other differences. Is that, uh, is, is that, does that work? I guess so. Okay, I'm just wondering if there was, I, I'm looking for a, 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 a sort of a, a... Yeah, I don't know if she can follow up. Um, I guess, uh, Natasha, if you... Uh, great, thanks, she says. Okay. Okay. And uh, we have a couple of questions from Rahwa. She, you had mentioned, Matthew, about PCR bias, and she has noted um, about the technical artifacts. How has your work overcome that to identify the biological variability without the overrepresentation of shorter amplicons? Yeah, that's, I guess the first step is to, you know, recognize that problem, uh, that that problem exists. And then uh, you can kind of keep that, you can make that part of your decision making in terms of what are the specific primers I'm going to use or the specific uh, genetic locus I'm going to target for this experiment and it's it's best if I mean the goal and the ideal is that this method is truly universal and you can see everything sort of in an in an untargeted way. In practice it's best if if your specific experimental goals can be allowed to kind of dictate which amplicon and which primers and so on am I going to use uh, with some less than universal, target in mind. Uh, I mean, as the sort of most straightforward example, there's no one amplicon that works for both bacteria and fungi. Or if you're interested in oomycetes as plant pathogens or for other reasons, usually they get their own amplicon. Uh, so it would be uncommon to try to profile you know, both fungi and oomycetes together. Um, so in practice, we still do some degree of targeting what we're trying to look for. But um, so that's part of it. And then, you know, you can also go and look in your data to see whether these kinds of effects are likely to be large. So the bioinformatics that I didn't spend a lot of time on, but much of it is, is about trying to decide which data is reliable and which data is lower quality. Often we end up having to trade off introducing or accentuating some biases for the sake of improving overall data quality. So you can, for example, look in your very raw unprocessed data for taxa that may have uh, longer than average amplicons. And you can then see empirically, do those decrease in frequency as a result of my decisions about data processing or not. Okay, 
uh, Rahwa raised her hand, so I, uh, I've let you speak. I think you can speak if you wanted to expand on your question. Sure. I actually was going to suggest instead, more, more like, uh, not so much in agriculture, but in human health, um, there are unique molecular identifiers that tag the DNA in the original sample. That way you can see just how much of the same thing is amplified multiple times. That way you can see how much coverage of your DNA in the original sample is in your sequences. That was the suggestion I had. Thank you. It was a great Yeah, talk. thanks for that. It's a, it's, a neat, uh, it's a neat strategy to kind of mark the molecules before you start amplifying them. That's not yes, one that I've actually implemented myself. But, uh, yeah, I appreciate the suggestion. It helps in the cleanup of your data. Thanks for the talk. Okay, um, have a question here from Rob Golden. I've had nice progress on the bean inoculum. It seems that as some of the lines generations show improved performance, the variation around the mean also increases. Is there a strategy or mechanism for reducing that level of variation once suitable strains are found? Um, yeah, there are. I, I, I've got a flippant answer and I've got a better answer. The flippant answer is do more plants um, <laughs> and get a better, to get a better answer. Um, in, in some cases, especially like some of the, uh, the uh, ones that we are just currently evolving, there are very few replicates in that. And, you know, uh, we, we had some problems with uh, thrips and whatnot in the greenhouse. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, one is, yes, just to do the, get, get better replications and get the numbers really hard. The other one is to get a better actual uh, measure of what the uh, rate of nitrogen fixation is. And to that end, we've gone to, uh, we've, we are setting up a gas exchange analysis where we can non-destructively uh, measure hydrogen evolution as a proxy for nitrogenase, as it's a, it's a byproduct that happens and it just has to happen. And then that way we, it, it will allow us to monitor one plant, as well as if we take that and we go back and then we can express the, the numbers more on a per gram dry weight, which will give us a better specific activity of what the nitrogenase is. So I, I think that that's sort of the combination of, of getting better numbers uh, to getting it more firmed up. But yes, I acknowledge that they're there as well. Thank, thanks for liking the work, Robin. Okay. Um, I have a, another question from Jolene Halliday. Um, she asks, how does one select the best primers for the Amplicon generation? Uh, that's for you, Matthew. Okay. Um, so it depends on your specific objectives to a large extent, but even, uh, if your objectives are general to the point of like, I wanna know all the fungi that are here, um, there are still better and worse, you know, primers to select. So there are, there are at this point a decent number of papers whose mission is to answer that question, like what are the least biased or what are the uh, sort of preferred primers for this or that type of sample, is it, uh, you know, one example of something to consider is, are you trying to profile the microbiome in that background that's got a lot of host DNA or not? So um, particularly for eukaryotic components of the microbiome, it can be hard to, for instance, amplify fungal genes without also amplifying the corresponding gene in, in the plant host. And so different primers may be required uh, for those samples with high host DNA background compared to if you're, you know, looking in soil or, or whatever, we may not have to worry about that as much. There's still some exploring of, you know, different, different genes to sequence, but to a large extent, you know, the, the majority of studies are using the same genes uh, as each other. And so there are quite, quite well-established databases that can be used to sort of in silico predict which primers are, are gonna you know, be biased against which groups of organisms. Um, but there has to always be this sort of balance between in silico testing and, and empirical testing with you know, cultures and, and known, known communities and so on as well. 
Okay. And a question for Ivan. What do you think of the factors from the host or the environment that are causing the changes in the genome as you go through the iterations or generations of the isolate lineages? Okay, that's, that's really a good question. Um, the, the way that the process works is that when, when the bacteria are going to replicate their DNA, it's not a perfect process. So if, you know, there is an inherent error rate that happens. I think the one thing that happened that, that, that you find that the more genomes that you look at, um, th these are just happening all the time, they're random. So you're looking at when, we're, when you're inoculating a plant and you're, you, you, you've got, you put say a million or 10 million uh, bacteria on that plant and they're going to proliferate. So they're very gonna quickly become to a hundred million. And every time they replicate, they could, they could end up making a mistake. Now the question is, is it a good mistake or is it a bad mistake? Most mistakes are just silent and they don't do anything. Where the, the, the trick here is really that the ability to see an effective nodule is an incredibly powerful way of actually pulling out the mistakes that we're looking for. So I wouldn't really say that it's anything from the environment per se, that is certainly if they're a little bit more stressed, they might make more mistakes don't we all? Uh, but it is just a natural process that, that's occurring. And so that's one of the beauties of this is we're, all we're doing is letting the bacteria itself find, uh, make mistakes and the plant is selecting the ones that work. Okay, I actually see that Jerlene has her hand raised. So Jerlene, did you wanna? I just wanted to follow up with that question. Um, thanks for the really great presentation. So, um, yeah, like, so you're saying that the re like high replication rate of the bacteria can cause these random mutations, albeit like silent mutations that can cause the change or variation in the genome. Um, what about if, if there's any evidence at all with from the host that's um, it's because um, it's for, um, that that it's secreting something or producing something that's causing a change in the bacteria? No, I, I, I don't believe there's any ev evidence to, to, to that um, way. Like, I mean, certainly if you're going to take any bacteria and, and, and uh, put in some kind of a chemical that's an insult to it, say that, that, that can damage DNA, that's certainly going to increase the, the frequency of, of uh, mutations that occur. But by and large, I, I believe what we're looking at is just a, a normal process where you, you are going to make uh, get these uh, small nucleotide, small SNPs that, that occur. And if you look at if you look at some of them that, that we had, like on, on the table that was up, not all like the ones we, we do see things like you know if you've got a run of say four a four A's in a row, right? Uh, if there's a slippage that occurs when it, when it, when it's when it's replicating, that might become five A's. Like you know, sometimes it's just the physical nature of the DNA itself that makes an area possibly more prone to things like a slippage. And then there's other cases where it's just a mistake that doesn't get fixed, and it gets propagated on, on onwards. So again, so I most of it what we're looking at is I believe a very natural process. We're not growing anything in a stressed stressed way and I'm not aware of the plant uh, secreting anything that was going to be uh, toxic or that, that that is going to stress it quite in that manner. I guess if okay. you go through you can find all kinds of stresses but uh, by and large I, I would just say that we're looking at, uh, at a more natural type process. Okay thank you. Okay great. Uh, we have another question Dr. Backer said that we can identify the pathogens in the soil by microbiome profiling. How fast is this process to identify the microorganisms in the soil? Well, uh, okay, let me first add a caveat, which is that, um, you know, for some taxa, we can, we can see the name and know pretty clearly, like, okay, this is undesirable. There's really no circumstance in which we want to have aphanomyces in the soil or whatever. For many other taxa, you see the name and it's sort of like, yeah, I don't know, is it is it bad or not? It's, you know, we can't tell for, for a lot of organisms. So I wanted to clear or just kind of hedge that a little bit. The speed, um, well, you could, you know, you can make you can make things faster if you have 
pre-trained personnel and, and specific objectives and, and are willing to kind of hone in on those objectives specifically, you could do this quite rapidly. Um, if, but yeah, that depends on knowing exactly what you want to ask and having people trained in advance to process the data. You could do it in, in days. Okay. And have you identified any methanotrophs in the soil that you've been monitoring from? Um, I've never, you know, analyzed it formally, but I've noted their presence, yes. I don't know that, uh, you know, I don't think I've got evidence of treatment effects altering their abundance, but, but they're detectable. Okay. Uh, Rupinder Kaur has asked, um, how are farmers being encouraged to do genome testing? Either of you have any suggestions on that one? I'm not sure I, I know exactly the intent of the question. There are, there are you know, companies and services now that try to market uh, microbiome profiling of, of soils you know, directly to farmers. Um, it's not clear to me that, the, that we're quite ready for that information or, or know how to take action on it. But Yeah, I think it's probably a bit soon for that. Um, let's see, I think we've done just about all the questions here. Um, yeah, I think that's it. It's a lot of questions actually, but uh, great. Um, my only question for you, Ivan, is how long before we can stop using nitrogen as a, an applied fertilizer and just take it from the air? Well, it depends. It depends on your, it will depend so much on your crop, right? Like you grow soybean, and they put nothing. They they, they don't they don't put any nitrogen in at all. Mm -hmm. right? And the the the, bigger, the biggest problem, let's say, with with that that I see with the beans is that there is that potential to unhook it, you know, from actually, you know, there's the want for the crop, and if you're going to grow it, and your inoculums don't work, as a grower, you're going to do exactly what you need to do, and that's I'm going to fertilize these things because I could still get the beans at the end. And it, it really leads to a whole bunch of other problems because when you are putting down uh, reduced nitrogen into the soil, a lot of that just gets blown up by microorganisms or gets run up and goes into a runoff. From the perspective of where the, the work with uh, just the bean inoculum is, if we do ha have something that's effective, it really means two things. One, it becomes a much more sustainable crop to grow. Right, in, in, under, uh, under the conditions that we're doing it in. The other one, it also can, will mean an increase to the bottom line to the grower. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, I think that, that's what's driving it. There is an awful lot of uh, research that goes on into nitrogen fixing. And one of the holy grails is, can we transfer this into a, uh, some of the other cereal crops? And I think that that's quite a ways off. There's, there's people that are looking at strategies as, we do understand a lot about the nodulation process and the signaling. Um, and there are people saying, well, you know, like a nodule is not that unique a structure. It really is derived from a developing root. Somewhere down the way, there's uh, duplication in some of the genes involved and they become much more specialized. We have uh, the, the signaling between uh, things like mycorrhizas and nodules. They share a lot of co commonalities. And so people really are trying to leverage these to come up with different strategies to one, either be able to make an, a, a synthetic association, or there's other people that are leveraging it to say, you know what, this might not really work, but if we could get bacteria that can associate with it, with the roots and fix nitrogen and release it, then that's also going to decrease the amount of input nitrogen that has to go on. And those are some of the strategies where people are, are going off within the nitrogen fixing field of, of where they're going to go. Mm, it's an interesting thought. Sustainability is better. <laughs> Thank you both for your great talks and answering all those questions. And uh, I'd also like to thank my, my colleagues at Genome Prairie for helping out. And uh, thanks to the audience for, for coming and 
we'll have another one of these probably another couple months and maybe we'll see all of you again. Okay, thanks, bye. Thank you very much.